a KQED television production. Closed captioning of this program is made possible by the Fireman's Fund Foundation. He's out. Mayor Gavin Newsom makes a surprise announcement this afternoon that he's dropping out of the governor's race. The Bay Bridge remains closed after a 5,000-pound steel beam fell onto the upper deck, causing closures in both directions. The governor releases his final plan for cutting hours and services at state parks due to the budget deficit. And on this Halloween weekend, a story about Day of the Dead traditions. Coming up next. Hello, I'm Belva Davis. Welcome to This Week in Northern California. Other stories in the headlines this week, a long-awaited plan to solve the state's water problem was released after weeks of closed-door negotiations. But there are no political agreements on enacting it. Democrats and Republicans remain divided over the details. The site of the largest World War II homefront disaster has been made a memorial and part of the National Park Service. President Obama signed legislation creating a Port Chicago memorial in Concord. More than 300 sailors lost their lives there after a giant explosion at the ammunition site. Most of them were African American. Are Californians ready to legalize marijuana for recreational use? San Francisco Assemblyman Tom Amiano thinks so. He held a three-hour-long hearing this week where advocates and law enforcement debated the issue. It's estimated that the state could bring in as much as $1.4 billion a year in sales tax revenue if marijuana was legal. And it was 40 years ago this week when two computers communicated with each other, marking the anniversary of the ARPANET, the predecessor to the Internet. Go to our website at kqed.org slash this week to see an interview with Mark Weber, senior curator for the Computer History Museum in Mountain View. And there's also a link there for our special 40th anniversary coverage page. Now on to our news panel, Andrea Kissick, senior editor of KQED Public Radio. Tom Vakar, consumer editor for KTVU News and Scott Schaefer, host of the California Report, KQED Public Radio. Well, Scott, was this truly a surprise, maybe even to the Democratic Party? I think it's always a surprise, Belva, when suddenly somebody drops out who's been one of the leading candidates, but this has been rumored for weeks, months, really, that Gavin Newsom was going to drop out. And really, if you look at two numbers, it's not hard to understand why. The polling numbers have shown that uh, even though uh, Attorney General Jerry Brown hasn't even announced yet that he's running, he's been running uh, Newsom 20 points behind in the statewide polls, as much as 40, 45 points behind uh, among older voters. And then if you look at the money numbers, uh, Jerry Brown has raised about seven times as much money as Gavin Newsom had. And, uh, and when you look at donors who you might have expected would give money to Gavin Newsom, people in San Francisco, for example, who had uh, supported him in the past, he wasn't even getting money in big, num big chunks from those folks. So he was faced with a tough choice. And uh, today, Friday, he issued a statement saying that uh, his responsibilities at home and at City Hall were basically too great to allow him to do those things right and also run for governor. He's got a new daughter who was born a couple of months ago, and uh, and he is still mayor uh, of the city. Uh, so what, what did he say he was planning to do? I mean, is he out not considering the lieutenant governor slot that <laughs> Willie Brown keeps pushing? Well, it is a chessboard, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> and uh, J Willie Brown had been suggesting weeks ago that uh, he would have a better chance of running for lieutenant governor. That's a much weaker field. and. Next Tuesday, John Garamendi is likely to be the current lieutenant governor, is likely to be elected to Congress, which will give the governor an appointment and then uh, have a, uh, an election next year for that. That's uh, a post. But given what he said today, that his uh, family obligations and his mayoral obligations 
wouldn't allow him to run a credible campaign for governor, I think it would be hard for him to turn around and say, but I could run for lieutenant governor. Mm -hmm. So I think that uh, he's out uh, in this round. And, uh, you know, it doesn't mean he doesn't have a future in politics. And many, many people think he does. He's young. He's in his early 40s and very charismatic and all those things. But uh, this may not be his year, or at least 2010 may well, not be his year. Was the smoke and fire over Prop 8 the thing that really did him in? Because a lot of people saw that, whether you like it or not, and just took that as a kind of an arrogant attitude about things. I mean, was, did that hurt him? Well, there's no question that it hurt him statewide among all voters, uh, particularly in places that voted uh, for Prop 8, the anti-gay marriage ballot measure. Uh, but in the Democratic primary, it probably didn't hurt him so much. What really hurts him, I think, is Jerry Brown. I mean, Jerry Brown has been in politics for 40 years. Uh, it's a great brand. Uh, his dad was governor. He was governor. He's been lieutenant governor. He's been a, or a secretary of state and now attorney general. He's been on the ballot, you know, almost, uh, you know, for most of the last 35, 40 years. And so it's tough. Uh, and he has pretty high approval ratings, mm -hmm. you know, uh, which wouldn't have been the case back in 1982 when he uh, left the governor's office. But it's hard to, it takes a lot of money to overcome those kinds of advantages uh, that Jerry Brown has. Yeah, and that the whole Governor Moonbeam thing is long since long gone. Long gone. Well, and ironically, I was you know, say, Tom, you and I are probably the only ones who remember that. I remember <laughs> that, but you, but you know what? What, we, what people may have forgotten is that what the reason uh, Mike Royko, the columnist from Chicago, called him that is that he was calling for for California to launch its own satellite. Well, yeah. they've done that, you know. So uh, he was ahead of his time in a lot of ways. So it's yeah. going to be hard to beat Jerry Brown unless you're Diane Feinstein. <laughs> Well, somebody like Dianne Feinstein, but there aren't a lot of people like Dianne Feinstein, somebody who has a positive uh, name ID, high name ID, has money to either raise or spend. Um, but it's hard to think who that might be uh, in the Democratic Party. Now, if Jerry Brown slips up somehow, uh, it's always possible that somebody else uh, could jump in. Via Ragosa down in Los Angeles could change his mind. But, uh, you know, it does, uh, it is hard to see who that would be. But the great thing about politics is that it rarely ends up the way you think it's going to end up, at least without some twists and turns that you didn't anticipate. And the Republican, the, the likely Republicans are no, no one to scoff at here. Well, no. Steve Poisner and Meg Whitman both have a lot of money. Uh, Meg Whitman's already spent at least $20 million of her own, and she said she'll spend whatever it takes to get elected. So a lot of that money, uh, Poisner also very personally wealthy, they'll spend a lot of that money dragging down whoever the Democratic nominee is. Mm -hmm. And so um, it's going to take somebody who uh, knows how to deal with that kind of hostile political incoming fire, you know, to really withstand uh, that election. Before we move on, is there any advantage to Jerry Brown declaring now? Not really. I mean, he's continuing to raise money. He's doing all the things that a candidate does, but he's also still attorney general and he's suing banks and mortgage companies and, you know, fighting for the consumer. And he can do all of that uh, right up until the filing deadline and yeah. get lots of free media and, you know, positive media. It's yeah. the one big advantage of being attorney general and running for governor. Thank you, Scott. Mm -hmm. Now, Tom, you have two stories for us tonight. Uh, Oil spill and the bridge. <laughs> yeah, well, first uh, on the oil spill, 6.30 this morning, uh, a boat being refueled uh, called the Dubai Star, a big oil tanker, uh, was being refueled and was taking on bunker oil and somehow uh, something broke and an unknown number of gallons of this bunker fuel, the same stuff that was spilled by the Costco Busan, mm. 53,000 mm. gallons then, much smaller, the, the estimates are about 800, went into the bay. Uh, caused uh, an incredible response. Uh, this is the lesson of the Costco Busan. Uh, there was so much equipment out there so quickly, uh, and of course we had perfect weather conditions. We had, uh, you know, a fairly small spill, and it was just astonishing to see that. And the city uh, of San Francisco folks were very clear about this. Uh, the head of the port and the head of emergency uh, services said that it was exactly what you wanted. We were notified immediately. Uh, we were involved in this thing from the very start, and they gave uh, the Coast Guard uh, very high marks. But it impacted upon your second story. Wow, did it. Um, <laughs> the second story is just uh, mind-boggling. Uh, and that is that the Bay Bridge may not be open Saturday, may not be open Sunday, and there's no guarantee now that it'll even be open Monday. Uh, going back to Tuesday, let's just do that. What happened was that a part of the bridge, which was the major repair that was done after the new section was slid in, they found this thing called an eye bar that was cracked. They basically built a cap for it. And what happened was that uh, this cap under extraordinary pressure, this is how they keep this whole thing together, um, popped off on uh, Tuesday, 5,000 pounds of uh, metal and uh, cable came down and uh, hit a car, 
Uh, actually, three cars were involved in an accident. Amazingly, nobody was killed, only one minor injury. And as a result of all of this stuff, uh, the bridge had to be closed. The problem was in the repair um, that they've run into all kinds of problems, uh, and some of the excuses are becoming, you know, kind of a little hard to swallow. They said, for example, that um, these, this design did not contemplate high winds and vibrations. That's what bridges are all about. <laughs> you don't design a bridge without contemplating that. Uh, that when to you me, say they, let's be clear. Well, in this case, it was a Caltrans uh, private partnership design of this repair. And it was done, I think, with the best of intentions and according to Caltrans was completely vetted. The problem was that when you see this thing laying on the ground, you realize that the whole checks and balance system of engineering failed because you look at the design, you review it. You look at the, I the fabrication of the part and you review it. You look at the installation and you review it. You look at the testing and you review it. And finally, you look at the whole system and say, is this right? Everybody signed off on this. And, you know, less than 60 days after it was installed, it almost caused a, a, a horrific tragedy. It's also caused all kinds of economic problems. It's caused incredible inconvenience for people, and it is a mess of the first water. What do you think it does to Caltrans's uh, credibility? Because they seem to be having a hard time kind of managing the information. One day, the bridge is going to be open the next day. The next day, it's not. Yeah. Uh, you know, they've claimed, they said it was safe back in, you know, in September when they opened it. Turned out it wasn't, of course. And, and, and then they said, well, we did it right. It just was we forgot to do this and that, but everything was right, basically. Yeah. And just, you know, wonder about their credibility. Well, remember, uh, uh, under the just departed uh, director, Will Kempton, they had a string of successes that were just incredible. Mm -hmm. The rebuilding of Devil's Slide, the uh, rebuilding of the maze very, very quickly, the complete replacement of the Geyser Bill Bridge washed away by the Russian River in less than six months, unbelievable. And then Mariposa uh, County, where the landslide wiped out the road and they were able to build bridges around, mm -hmm. they had this unbroken change of successes and it was like incredible and of course uh, the name C.C. Myers became very big because they were responsible for all this. Well Mr. Kempton leaves and uh, now there's new management in there and two things have happened. Number one, the chain has finally been broken and that can happen on anybody's watch. But instead of letting Bart Ney, who is a completely competent, believable, trustworthy person. The spokesperson for yeah, Caltrans, yeah. Yeah, the Secretary of Transportation comes down and, you know, starts laying out, well, what's going on? And basically buries the lead by saying, you know, five or six or seven minutes into this thing that, well, we're not going to open the bridge. Uh, and this is the same thing that happened when the Schwarzenegger administration first came in. They were having trouble, mm -hmm. trouble with the Bay Bridge. They told the public affairs people to cool it. The public affairs people are the people we believe. We have very big difficulty believing some of these appointees, mm -hmm. and as a result, uh, they need to get back on the track that Will Kempton put them on. Okay. Tom, you mentioned the name C.C. Myers, and the night the incident happened, Tuesday night, Bart Ney said, we're going to get C.C. Myers out here, we're going to fix this. Mm -hmm. That's not the contractor. I don't know who it is. They seem to have snuck somebody else in. They're not talking about it. I don't know yeah. why they're not using C.C. Myers. Yeah. Well, MCM Contractors Construction, this is a very good company, and they know how to do this kind of stuff. I think what they wanted to do was they wanted to have a clean break with the with the whole past of that bridge. Remember, C.C. Myers actually slid that thing in and may have had some things to do with the uh, repair, although I think it was the American Bridge flew our people that actually put it together. Part of it is that they wanted a clean break, said, oh, you know, we've had this terrible thing, let's, let's do this all above board and let's do it with new people and all of that stuff. And in fact, uh, they have third parties they've invited in, private people, public people, including the Federal Highway Administration. So before this bridge is fixed, I promise you that everybody and their grandmother is going to sign off on it before this bridge is open again. Well, you know, and let's, uh, let's not forget that the S-curve has been a big problem, too. I mean, there was an overturned Safeway truck that caused a huge backup and another accident other than that. So it really, I mean, the whole, this phase of the bridge is re uh, repair and rebuilding has really been problematic. Well, I mean, remember now, here's a bridge that stood there in that alignment for 80 years. Suddenly you change the alignment, you change a lot of the forces, and certain things have happened. And this will be the subject of much study for years to come. But the reality is this needs to last for the next four years because we cannot finish the signature span and the signature tower until, uh, you know, this old section that was disconnected is torn down and they can build the new section. So it is vital that this be uh, in place, vital that it be working all the time, and most importantly, importantly, safe. They have a lot of risky work to do in the future. Do you think that confidence, that's where we started, has been lost as they try to 
replace these major parts of the bridge for months to come. Yeah. I think that it just really depends on how well this repair works. If we get past another 60 days and there are no more incidents or anything like that, I think people will very quickly forget what's going on. The problem is that this is a major project. This has never been tried ever before, and there's always that kind of nagging doubt there, and this just didn't help that. But I think Caltrans is a good organization, probably the best highway organization in the country, and still can earn its stripes and do well. And we forgot one thing. There was a ferry closed, so the ferry closed on the bay, the bridge was closed, traffic, uh, yeah. it's... Uh, yeah. Right, because they close the estuary. <laughs> yeah, for yeah the they close the estuary to keep so the oil spills out, so the ferries can't do it. So it's BART or, uh, or you know, take the long Stay way home. Stay home if you can. <laughs> yeah. Well, to get the latest on the Bay Bridge closures, as well as helpful links for commuters, at kqed.org slash baybridge. Well, Andrea Kissick, the governor has made a number of proposals for um, cuts in the State Park Service. Uh, they've all moved to what we now think is the final plan. Is this the final plan? It's the final plan because it involves um, cutting back $14 million on the state, uh, on the state uh, parks uh, budget. Because uh, the governor, if you'll remember back in September, said we're gonna close 100 parks to deal with uh, the budget gap. Uh, that wasn't uh, welcomed by park supporters. He backed off of it, but he said you still have to cut $14 million out of the budget. Well, it's an already lean budget because they've been getting cuts for years. They have a $1 billion maintenance budget already built up. Um, they, I mean, park use has gone up over the last 20 years, but uh, they haven't been able to add rangers, lifeguards, maintenance people. So they've been trimming all the fat and uh, they've lost most of their seasonal workers this year. So what this means is uh, you're not going to to close all the parks, but you're going to close some of the parks some of the time. So sort of have a series of rolling closures. Some parks will close for a day here and there. Others will scale back hours, like uh, state museums and uh, missions. You'll also be seeing um, trash cans removed. So maybe trash can service will go, will be cut back. They'll actually cut uh, and take the trash cans out, put padlocks on some of the bathrooms. Angel Island's going to close some bathrooms. So if you're trying to do a five and a half mile loop around the island, you might want to stop at Ayala Cove when you get there at first. They're going to uh, postpone field trips, um, so it, and then you can't make any ma uh, camping reservations. What are they going right to have? Maximum numbers of people that can be in any particular area. If there are no, if there are no trash cans and there are no bathrooms, what? Well, people are going to have to learn how to this? clean up after themselves because otherwise, we're really going to have a problem. How do you keep people out of a park? I mean, if they want to pee in the. You know, pardon my, you know, my well, French, I mean, but you know, I mean, what's going to throw, I mean, I throw think in trash? They're in the realistic bushes? about this. People are going to sneak into the parks. I mean, they're not actually closing off parks. They're closing off day-use parking lots. The top half of Mount Tam, for instance, you can't park at Bootjack Camp or somewhere where you're going to take a hike up. So you're going to lose the parking spaces, and you're going to have problems with. Um, with getting into to, um, education centers and museums and so forth, but people will be able to get into the parks. There won't be a lot of services uh, at all the parks for them, or as much as they're used to. So that's an issue. Uh, let me ask you this. Is it possible, though, that once these cuts actually start taking place that um, you know individuals might join the park system or some um, you know for lack of a better word angels may donate money to this to keep them going because it seems that a lot of bad could go bad very quickly mm -hmm. uh, and might that actually bring people into the plight of the park uh, let's face it 14 million dollars for a system that size doesn't seem like a lot of money. Well, it doesn't seem like a lot, but they've been cut and they've been cut and they've been cut. And next year, the governor's already signed off on 22 million more dollars. So you're looking at places like Henry Coast State Park, which has 87,000 acres, and you only have a couple rangers to patrol it. That's three times the size of San Francisco. Um, so they're, um, I mean, the best thing that could have happened, and ironically, is to have closed a lot of parks, create a huge a public outcry, and have the, legisl the legislature pass some kind of user fee or something on but the, the isn't there a petition drive out there? There is, and so that it didn't work in the legislature, but park supporters are looking at um, proposing at qualifying for the 2010 ballot uh, with a measure that would add about a $15 uh, uh, registration, vehicle registration fee. So once a year, you'd pay $15, a motorist would, and then you'd be able to access any park without paying. It's been tried in Montana and Washington and worked okay. So, um, you know, that's something they're considering. They're expected to announce in the next few weeks. Um, um, so people could go to, it's probably going to be an expensive campaign, so it's not going to be a voluntary checkbox. I think they'll be expecting people to 
But it could be so. kind of a badge of honor to have that sticker on your car. I mean, it might be worth it just for the, I don't know, for, for the kitsch of it. Well, we'll all get that sticker if it mm -hmm. goes on to a vehicle license uh, user fee. They have tried to get more people to join the mm -hmm. parks, and that hasn't worked. In fact, they didn't raise fees this past year because they were worried less people would use the parks. Is, is there any risk of, uh, you know, sort of, if they're not going to be in there taking care of the parks, that making the, the risk for wildfires worse? Yeah, I mean, they're going to be doing less trail maintenance, and um, there are things the rangers are trained to do that volunteers aren't trained to do, and they're relying more and more on volunteers. So, yeah, there's a concern about fire, about um, theft, uh, squatting. I mean, I don't know, people can grow pot farms. <laughs> I mean, it's just you're going to have less um, maintenance and, and more neglect, really, of the parks. More neglect uh, and more cuts. So does Bad not combo. look good. Does not look good. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Scott, Tom, and you, Andrea. Well, this weekend is the celebration of the traditional Mexican holiday, the Day of the Dead. Acclaimed artist Amelia Mesa Baines keeps Day of the Dead traditions alive in the Monterey area, where the Latino population has grown rapidly in recent years. Our Spark production team recently visited with Mesa Baines. Okay, one of the things we're going to be doing today is completing the process of our collective uh, class altar. When you put the image on the altar, you are remembering somebody who is very important either to you or to your family. MacArthur award-winning artist Amalia Mesa Baines is here at Cal State Monterey Bay teaching a class on the Day of the Dead traditions. In memory of Raimundo Castro, my grandfather, in memory of my Uncle Joe. This flower is thought to be a smell that brings the spirits. Sometimes people take the Sempasuchle and they will rub it between their fingers and sprinkle it because it releases the olor, the smell. Dia de los Muertos, or Day of the Dead, takes place on November 1st and 2nd. With its origins in an ancient Aztec holiday, it's a time when people gather to commemorate loved ones who've died. The construction of temporary altars, or ofrendas, is central to the tradition. There is always a candle uh, to light the way. Uh, there's always water or other beverages for the souls who are thirsty to quench their thirst. And there are various other bread, special pan de muerto, and these are all arranged in offerings for the dead. The central quality of Day of the Dead is the act of remembrance. It is a reenactment of the most cherished memories and love that you felt. And now we get the part that's the best part of Day of the Dead, which is the enjoyment. So we're going to go find some music. So it is joyful and celebratory, but it also has an element of real deep remembrance. Today I chose to honor my uh, grandfather father and my grandmother. They worked so hard their whole entire life. I put a little wooden sculpture uh, to represent my grandfather because he was a carpenter. You know, it has not been a tradition that we've carried on in my family, but it's recently become one of my favorite celebrations. What I've discovered is that it's not a given that because a young student has a Mexican heritage that they will have actually uh, learned this tradition. They know about it, they've heard about it. But in the process of immigration, they've set it aside. Many of Mesa Bain's students hail from the agricultural communities in the area. Currently Latinos, many of whom are immigrants, make up more than half the population of Monterey County. I grew up in Salinas, California. My parents were both from Mexico. A couple of weeks ago, I asked my mother if I could set up an altar. At first, she, didn't, she wasn't too sure because of the fact that she said it would bring back painful memories, but I talked her into at least letting me light up a candle with my family members' pictures. Growing up, the Day of the Dead or Dia de los Muertos wasn't really so prominent in my life. My family, half of them are Christian, and the Christian family was always very hesitant to celebrate the dead. I think there is some feeling in more uh, conservative parts of the community that um, the celebration of death is 
is somehow not normal. It's, it's mourning the dead, yes, but celebrating, no. In other words, you would be hard pressed to bring any elements of Day of the Dead into a Catholic church. In the mid-1970s, Vesa Baines began to make fine art installations inspired by the altar-making tradition. Many of the pieces pay tribute to feminist icons of Mexican descent. Her work has been acquired by the Williams College Museum of Art in the Smithsonian and garnered her a MacArthur grant in 1992. I was most concerned with the role of women. And I have found that as I've moved through what I would say is a sort of personal story, it has turned out to be the story of many women of my generation, many Chicanas and Latinas, who began to think about issues of beauty and acceptability in the larger society. At home in San Juan Batista, Mesa Baines tends a home altar, a personal collection of photographs and mementos. The home altar is the permanent ongoing record of the family's daily life and the major life events of the family. This is distinct and different from an ofrenda, which is an offering only for the days of the dead. My grandmother liked a good drink, so every once in a while we slip her a little vodka. I see that in my students when they begin to research the individual they're putting in the class ofrenda they begin to have a different sense of who that person really was. In that home altar are the stories of what it is to be a Mexican in this country, what it is to be an immigrant in this country, and they are acts of resistance and resiliency, and they afford the family a collective sense of pride. Cal State University at Monterey Bay holds its annual Day of the Dead celebration on November the 2nd. It is open to the public. Visit our website at kqed.org slash this week. You can watch segments or complete episodes, comment on our stories, subscribe to our newsletter and podcast, and share your thoughts on my question of the week. This week, how will California state park closures and cuts affect you and the state? Finally tonight, in memory of famed Bay Area landscape architect Lawrence Halpin, who passed away this week, we close with images of some of the Bay Area landmarks that he designed. KQED's 1991 documentary, Lawrence and Anna Halpin's Inner Landscapes, airs this Sunday at 6 p.m. I'm Belva Davis. Good night. Major funding for Spark Stories are provided by Diane B. Wilsey. Additional funding provided by the George Frederick Jewett Foundation, Helen Sarah Steyer, and Fred Levin and Nancy Livingston of the Shenson Fund.